Hello there, welcome back to the booth here in Kyoto. That's Luis Scott Vargas, I'm Marshall Seckliff, and it is time for round number nine, where we have our last two undefeated players and the players who we happen to watch on both the video and recorded draft here in Kyoto. We've got Paulo Vitor Dama Rosa versus Seth Manfield right now. Hello and welcome back to coverage here of Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. I'm Marshall Cycliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas and we're ready for round nine action. This is the first round of the second booster draft here in Kyoto and players are ready. We've got Paulo Vitor Damodarosa from Brazil. He plays for team Channel Fireball Ice. He is 8-0 and in the tournament, undefeated overnight. Perfect record coming from yesterday. Only one other player was able to do that, Luis. That, of course, is his opponent, Seth Manfield, from Team Genesis, also from the United States. And, uh, yeah, one player is going to leave with a mark on their record, and one will stay perfect and be the last player in the tournament with a perfect record here. Uh, we got to watch both of these players draft here, Luis. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of the matchup and uh, overall power level of the decks? I, I like Seth's deck a bit more than I like Paulo's. I do think that Paulo's deck has some good high-end uh, if he can get a good Enigma Drake or uh, Warfire Javelin off, he's going to be in pretty good shape. Okay. Seth Manfield starts things off with a Merciless Eternal on his side. A Nimble Blade Kenra is going to have to do for Paulo Vitor Damodarosa. He also, well, it doesn't actually have Cycling, but we would use shorthand. He cycled a, cr a crash through just to, to get it out of his hand and get a new card. Yeah. Wow, is Seth really going to block here? Well, he has to think, what are the cards that Paulo could play? Supreme Will would be one that it would be a, a, a real beating here. Mm -hmm. The type of card that Paulo can just sort of unabashedly play without being a combat trick. And look at that. It was a good block. Manfield blocked. Very smart from Seth there. Worked out well for him. Aerial Guide is a follow-up play here for Paulo. And Seth is going to start chipping in for a couple of damage turn here. Of course, the Merciless Eternal does have Afflict 2, so... At some point, if Paulo wants to block, he's going to have to plan out how that goes. And wow, here's a nice little two, excuse me, three into four here for Seth Manfield. Both of his creatures are zombies, and the Accursed Horde is a nice pickup. In the meantime, Paulo gets to attack freely here as the Aerial Guide is going to send the Nimble Blade Kenra into the skies. Aerial Guide's very nice on this board. Paulo has some good ground creatures, and so it's going to offer pretty good sources of damage. Both decks are... are Looking to race in this game, and Paulo's deck is pretty well set up to do so. The Seth, he did looks like he did just draw Saving Grace. He did, and yeah. That that is an excellent card in a race. Emberhorn Minotaur was the follow-up play there for Paulo Vitor Damodarosa, as he passes the turn back to Seth, who places land and then enters combat here with both creatures. The Accursed Horde, of course, doing its work here, making blocking. Pretty difficult for Paulo, who's just going to decline to and take five damage. This is a big turn here, though, for Seth. You can see he's got four swamps and a plane, so that first pick, Crested Sun Mare, will not be able to come down, if he, even if he does have it in his hand. Let's see if he does. Yeah, it looks like he does. Oh, boy, he no, does. No, no way to gain life currently, though. Yeah, still five fives, all right. Can't cast it, though, because of that uh, second white mana needed, so he's going to have to settle for Vizier of the True, currently his only exert creature going. Well, you know, we, we talked uh, going, coming into this format about uh, how blocking can be difficult, and it looks like, you know, there's more interact in, interaction than we thought, but games like this go take us back. We've got Aerial Guide, we've got Vizier of the True, we've got uh, Emberhorn Minotaur, Accursed Horde. All these cards punish blocking or make blocking difficult. That's right, and, you know, Aerial Guide doing its work here, sending that Emberhorn Minotaur to the skies to get in for six, and this is a really nice follow-up here. An ominous Sphinx now for Paulo Vitor Damodarosa, and, you know, this has just been a full-on curve-out race here, both players attacking early and often. And with uh, Paulo Vitor slightly ahead in the race as uh, Seth is at 11. But now Seth gets to be the one to crunch in for potentially a ton of damage here if he wants to exert that Vizier. Additional to that, he has a Blighted Bat in his hand that he could use to get in for even more damage. Well, but, that, but then he has to worry about Paulo dealing lethal on the crackback. So right. neither player, I think, has a huge advantage here. If anything, maybe Paulo's slightly ahead, but not... 
it, it's just turn by turn how much you know it's going to be very relevant like what ends up uh well going on here i'll tell you what that saving grace could be a big one here for seth like you said it's really good in a race because it can effectively wipe out one full attack step from paulo and that can be the difference Paulo's just going to chump block here because he recognizes that he's in a race scenario. And Seth has to decide, well, do I want to activate this Merciless Eternal? Do I want to save the mana for the bat? It feels like he wants to leave the mana up for saving grace regardless. Oh, he's certainly going to do that. The question is what, what, whether he does two more with Merciless Eternal or just plays Blighted Bat. One problem with the saving grace plan is if, if Seth doesn't have lethal on the following turn, whatever he puts saving grace on is going to die. And then if Seth doesn't have lethal, then... Apollo could just attack the turn after that. Yeah. So saving Grace on Vizier of the True that's exerted and not going to untap does mean that uh, Seth doesn't lose an attacker for the next turn. Yeah, and it would preserve lethal for Seth, uh, assuming he's okay with activating that Merciless Eternal. And that's also assuming that Apollo gets in with everything and doesn't have any blocks. Also, you know, this is going to be a risky proposition for Seth. Either way, cards like Unsummon can really muck up the works for him. So if Paulo goes for the win by casting Limits of Solidarity on Blighted Bat, attacks with everything, Seth goes Saving Grace on uh, Vizier of the True and then attacks back for lethal. So Paulo has to worry about uh, Seth having Saving Grace or it's not a whole lot else. Um, maybe uh, you know Jero's Resolve or Active Heroism, some card like that to, to untap a blocker. But Paulo does have the potential to go for lethal here. Paul is going to be racking his brain here for all the different types of tricks. Also, remember, we are playing in pod here at the Pro Tour, and that means that he may have seen a good number of the cards that Seth could have here, like the Saving Grace, potentially. Well, what Paul can also do uh, is if he limits of solidarity on Vizier of the True, exerts it to tap the Blighted Bat, mm -hmm. then Seth has to put Saving Grace on Blighted Bat or... Uh, Likely that one to have that die. Then, it, then if he has a land and if he draws a land next turn, he can attack for lethal with merciless eternal for six plus a cursed horde for three. So, will we have enough cards at that point? We'll have exactly two cards. Okay. This is going to be this is going to be incredibly close one way or another because Paulo's well, follow up that, play. Does he have two cards in hand now or three? He, he has, has three. three. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Because Paulo's follow up play of riddle form is not enough to to, to you know to provide a blocker. It, it doesn't do a very good job of that. Here's Lemus' Solidarity on Vizier the True. Okay, so Seth now gets, is forced to use Saving Grace. In order to, to, to go for the win, he's got a Saving Grace on the uh, Blighted Bat. But Paulo can also do those Leave Back Aerial Guide because he has Lethal even without... Uh, using the you, you attack with the guide because he can he can attack for a, eleven right there. He doesn't even have to exert his Emberhorn Minotaur. He's doing the math right now to just sort of sort through. There's the exert tap, and he says, okay. Is this enough? Wow, this has been a very, very close game. Yeah, this is one of those racing games that it's back and forth. Both players are just attacking, you know, <laughs> you know each time. Uh, not, not a whole lot of blocking. Saving Grace? It's, it's a swingy card. And this is not at its most powerful. This is, you know, one in a white fog that you have to sacrifice a creature to, to, to have it work. I've seen it be that a lot this weekend. I, I have not been impressed with it on camera thus far. Often the creature that it's gone on has also died. Ideally, you want to set up a bunch of blocks first, but, you know, the, in a race situation here, that's not going to happen. And as you can see... When it enters the battlefield, all damage will be dealt to 
Uh, this turn to you and permanence you control is dealt to the enchanted creature instead, which is plenty enough to kill the bat, even with the three toughness power bump. And Paulo will not have been surprised to see that saving grace. He certainly made that whole play sequence with the possibility in mind. And so if Seth has a, a sixth land here, he he can threaten lethal, but because of that aerial guide, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy for Seth to, to get in for enough damage. Yeah, that attack from Paulo may have swung things in his favor as uh, Seth does not play land number six here, Luis. So Vizier of the True was exerted by Seth, and then it was also exerted again by Paulo. Right. Um, so there's a chance it may have supposed to be un be untapped. Why is that? Well, if Paulo, Paulo exerting it doesn't prevent it from untapping on Seth's part, Seth's side of the board. But if it's the same object that gets stolen back and forth. Oh, I see, because, because it specifically says your next untap? Right. Interesting. I haven't seen that before, that interaction. I know that if you just straight up limits of solidarity an exert creature and exert it, it will untap on the opponent's next turn. Whether the fact that Seth exerted it on his last turn has any effect there... Is, is, the is, the, is the question. Yeah, this is the this is the point if I'm playing where I raise my hand and say judge. Yeah. And have somebody explain it to me. So Paulo is is dealing with non lethal here. He has to decide whether he wants to to basically just chump and potentially not not have a way to finish the game because his last card can't activate riddle form and if he blocks with aerial guide he's going he's going to be un unable to deal lethal. I think he decided not to block ultimately. Yeah. So it looks like because Seth exerted it does stay it does stay tapped. Okay. So the the board seat is correct. But Paulo's exerting didn't have anything to do with that. No. Right. <laughs> if Paulo were to steal it back, I guess it wouldn't untap on his turn either. <laughs> yeah. And so Seth chose not to play anything because nothing that he uh, could play would affect the board because all of Paulo's attackers uh, essentially have flying. So if Paulo goes for the win here, then uh, Seth doesn't have a way to stop that. Which he likely will. You can see that Paulo also used the hidden ability on riddle form. He scryed on his upkeep. You can pay two and a blue and scry. And this does exactly 11. 5, 9, 11. And that's game one going to Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. Very, very well played. Yeah, really, really cool game. Uh, that's the kind of game that gives you absolutely no wiggle room for mistakes on either side. And uh, it was Paulo, though, who was slightly ahead in the race and was able to capitalize on that as we went through. We've got a lot more lined up for you here from round nine, but we'll be back right after these messages. Check out Hour of Devastation booster drop leagues on Magic Online. Draft anytime, play anytime. Available now. For more information, visit mtgo.com.
and welcome back to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. I'm Marcel Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas, and uh, we're going to take a look at one of our side tables here. We've got uh, Yusuke Sasabe. He's playing against Donald Smith. They're both on 7 and 1. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some nonsense going on we've here. We've got a mirror match here. Uh, Luis, help us parse through this rather complicated board state here. So both players have a cursed horde and fan bearer, as it turns out. But the fact that uh, Yusuke is attacking this turn is going to give him a bit of an advantage. Merciless Eternal and a Cursed Horde make great attackers, and a Cursed Horde is so much better on offense than on defense that this turn is looking fairly good. Scrangio Soul is getting in there for three points of lifelink. Though Donald Smith does have a gate to the afterlife there, and he does have the God Pharaoh's gift as well, so... He's got a, a you know a potential threat coming up there if he can get enough creatures into his graveyard. You can see that he's perhaps comboed off. Perhaps he just cast the God Pharaoh's gift. I don't see that many creatures in his graveyard. But uh, you don't need that many. Is Donald Smith not blocking otherwise? Because if not, then it looks like it's lethal. With Merciless Eternal plus a Cursed Horde here. Uh-oh. And Yasuke can look over and see that there's no... Hmm. No mana available here for Donald. Interesting. Well, looks like Donald's untapped, and he only took two there. He's down to seven. Okay, the life totals might 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 have been uh, different then. They betrayed us. All right. Well, it that betrays. He. Um, all right. We'll hang for just a minute. Let's see if this God Pharaoh's gift can take over here. Uh, that's a good start. A solitary camel. That's going to have haste and lifelink. Probably. Let's see. Yeah, he does have, he does a, have desert. a desert. In yeah. So that's a 4-4 four, four haste lifelink camel. Now, there is fan bearer, though, on the other side for Yusuke. But it looks like Yusuke is actually going to tap down the flyer instead. Ah, time to reflect there from Yusuke. It's going to actually exile the solitary camel. And mean that Donald will gain no life here. Nice little setup there from Yusuke. And it looks like he's kind of going off with Steward of Solidarity there as well. <laughs> this game's gone on for a while. Yeah, he's got four warriors already. Is he able to push through for damage here? The fan bear on the other side will lock down something. And then he's got a pair of 3-3s three to contend with. But with Donald at 7... Yeah, Yusuke should be able to clean this up fairly quickly. Okay, well, why don't we head back to our, our main match then. Paulo Vitor Damodorosa versus Seth Manfield. They are ready to go. We'll keep you updated in that one. I can also tell you that Yuta Takahashi is playing against... Martin Yuza on one of our side tables. They're tied up at a game apiece. And in our T-Wu mirror match, Timothy Wu, spelled differently than Travis, uh, versus Travis Wu, the, uh, Timothy Wu's the one who's up a game in that. So we'll be updating you on that as well, as that one has big-time implications for who's going to become our draft master, as both of them are in the hunt for it. Yeah, as well as uh, Martin Yuza. So. That's right. We've got a very close draft master race going on here. So there's an Oketra's Avenger. Both players with a three drop uh, or a three power two drop. Uh, though Paulus takes a little bit more work. Riddle form does need need some activations here. Yeah, like I, like we mentioned during the draft, it is really much better at being an attacking threat. It's a it's more of a assertive card than not. There we go. But let's see if Seth has any... Nothing for the turn. All right, so that's a big reprieve there for Paulo Vitor Rosa. We have both players 
kind of missed on turn three. Like Paulo just played a, a desert and, and a crash through, and Seth did play nothing on turns three and four. So Paulo's got to be pretty happy about that. And here we go. This is why he took this card so highly. Sand Strangler. Humph. Yeah, just going to gobble up. The only threat on the other side of the battlefield here, a catcher's Avenger from Seth Manfield, if he doesn't have anything to say about it. Looks like he's got saving grace. Well, it's going to make the catcher's Avenger into a 3-4, but that still doesn't feel great. Y you know, you, you still kind of are, are down a card. Uh, because Okecha's well, Avenger already was pretty good at attacking. So yeah. mm -hmm. Paul still is, I think, reasonably happy with that exchange and reasonably happy with just how this game is going. We'll, we'll see what Seth plays this turn. This is a critical turn. You can't just do nothing on turns three, four, and five and, ha and expect to be in good shape. That's right. So Seth likely has plays this turn as otherwise what else is in his hand? All right. And it looks like he's going to just go for the main phase. Torment of Venom there. And he's looking to get that 3-3 three, three right off the board. So it looks like Seth just had two removal spells. He had Hour of Glory and Torment of Venom. Okay. And Paul wow. cashing in a frontline Devastator for, for three life there. Suppose Paul is down to 10 already. He's actually going to use strategic planning this turn rather than just casting the four drop. I like this. Picking up an Unsummon is also pretty nice against an Enchanted O'Catcher's Avenger, especially with Riddle Form in play. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, of course, the 3-3 the three, three Frontline Devastator just doesn't do much against the 3-4 attacker, so it's significantly worse. And there's that Unsummon. And he's got the Island in hand as well. Yeah, and I think Paulo was a dog to want to, want to pick up Emberhorn Minotaur there. Just he doesn't need another four drop. And he's already got some good threes to play here. He's got Supreme Will and Aerial Guide. So Paulo's got a, a, a nice hand. Having two islands this game is critical. If he didn't have that second island, then he'd be in a lot of trouble. But right now, he can just deploy two spells a turn. Got some updates coming in hot and furious here. Uh, Martin Yuza has won his match against Yuta Takahashi two games to one. So that's really good for Martin for Draftmaster, but also, well, Timothy Wu, two games to zero over Travis Wu. Probably knocking Travis out of the hunt. Uh, it's going to be hard. I he, mean, he, considering he just lost to one of the players who was also... Yeah, this is going to be a hotly contested race. And, yeah. Uh, it, it is funny, though. The stakes are different for different players. I think uh, Martin is in really good shape to make Worlds regardless. Mm. So he would love to to win uh, the race here because it's cool. You're, you're the draft master. But right. you, when you talk to a player like him versus a player like Travis or, or Tim Wu, they, they, their slot at Worlds largely depends on how they do in, in the race, whereas you know Martin or Owen, who's also in the hunt here, Eh, probably going to make it a Worlds regardless, so it's just a, a slightly different texture. Paulo looks like he's ready to line up this unsummon. And doing it now lets him uh, tackle with Riddle Form, so it's pr right. pretty important to main phase it. Yeah, he was setting up that from last turn. This got some gets in for five damage in the air. I think Seth might be priced into casting Hour of Glory at this point. Question is, which target? Do you, do you uh, hope that Paulo can't activate Riddle Form every turn for the rest of the game? And just take out the uh, the for sure aerial guide, or do you take out the the higher power riddle form here? My inclination is to take out the riddle form. Basically, it's close, it, but if you end up in a spot where Paulo doesn't have spells to play, he, the the scry on riddle form is still pretty good. That's right. That is a utility that uh, if this game does go on for a little while, he could really take advantage of. So Seth is going to in fact target the riddle form here with Hour of Glory. Hour of Glory is a rare, but it's also one of the better removal spells in this set. And are we going to see 
Oh, yeah. Supreme Will here from Paulo. We are. Oh, boy. Now, he did want to use that Supreme Will to activate Riddle Form at some point, potentially, but you know, he gets to keep Riddle Form this way, so it makes sense. He used that first mode on Supreme Will to counter it, and all Seth can do is poke in here with the Binding Mate. Well, the Binding Mummy. Now, he does, of course, have that follow-up play, and he, he does have Paulo down to six. Wow, that was a good draw for Paulo, though. He drew a struggle to survive. So uh, now he can kill Oketra's Avenger and attack with Riddle Form here. He could also kill the, the Binding Mummy, but given how few life points he has and how few cards are in Seth's hand, I think is, he's more likely to want to kill just the, the higher-powered creature. Yeah, he also has a Tokrop Skirmisher that he could use to block, assuming that you know it stays untapped. Yeah, Struggle was a big draw there for Paulo Vitor. Especially since Seth has Trial of Solidarity in hand. Seth is waiting to try to set up a, a, oh. a lethal alpha strike. and Wow, what a rip then. Being able to kill his opponent's creature and then follow it up with a Tokrop Skirmisher means that Seth now is facing down lethal in the air. Doesn't have a way to force Paulo to block. In fact, man, he needed Seth all of that? Like, if he just had uh, Struggle but no Tokrop Skirmisher, then Seth could just go Trial Kill You? Well... Seth's slightly short on on, on, oh, I'm on, sorry. on on killing Paulo regardless. Yeah. But otherwise, Seth would have to hope Paulo didn't have a spell for Riddle Form. But as things currently stand, Aerial Guide is just going to fly over for the win. Though, Struggle to Survive actually gives you a spell to cast because of that Painted Bluffs. Yes, it does, which is kind of interesting if Paulo... Is he doing it? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He's going to cast Survive, so the players are going to be and shuffling. Seth's not going to. <laughs> yeah. He may just decline. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's going to do it. Too the, much. The shuffling work. was too much. <laughs> it was too <laughs> much effort. And that was enough. Paulo Vitor, Domino Rosa pulls one together. You know, I have to say, coming into the draft, Seth's uh, deck looked a lot better. His draft went better. He got some bombs in there, a lot of removal. But Paulo just sort of calmly worked his way into uh, both tight race situations. And that means we've got one table left here. And we're going to jump back over uh, to Yusuke. Sasebe, he's playing against Donald Smith, and he, he was able to win that first game, by the way. We kind of figured he'd be able to push through enough damage, Sasebe, and, and he did. So he's up a game against Donald. Kind of figuring out how he wants to play things. Basically, if Sasebe wants to play a, a zombie this turn, he can tap down bat and attack for two. Otherwise, he would just attack first with the Binding Mummy, trying to offer the trade and may, may, maybe playing something like that Solitary Camel. He could also just not offer the trade at all, indicating he thinks that his Binding Mummy is you know, a bit more valuable than that Blighted Bet. Kind of interesting note here, Luis. Um, both of these players were at Seth Manfield's table. And if you remember, Seth was black-white, and both of these players are on black-white as well. So somehow we had three players on the same color pair. That does not happen very often. So Sasebe had a, a pretty nice little sequence last turn. He could have played Sunscorched Desert and played the Camel, but he chose not to waiting a turn so that uh, Donald wouldn't know that the camel was going to gain lifelink. Then he plays the desert, plays a zombie, taps down a curse toward attacks, lifelinks, and g gains some uh, much-needed life in this race. Yeah, that solitary camel could be a problem here for Donald if he wants to try to push the race. Yeah, that combined with Binding Mummy is going to make things fairly difficult. We also noted how open green was, and we can kind of see why. Yeah, we, we know that there's, We've watched at the very least, four drafters, <laughs> and not a single of them has forest in their deck. That's right. So Donald potentially going to respond to Merciless Eternal here by using Torment of Venom on the Binding Mummy. But it looks like he's actually fine with that. I think he'd rather Torment... Uh, Maybe the Eternal. Like, he can actually trade Oketra's Avenger for the Camel. So he's not, it's not as critical for him to, to deal with that right away. Well, this is setting up to be the kind of game where God, God Pharaoh's Gift plays a big role. Don't, Lots of trading. Yeah, he loves to make a couple trades. 
try to preserve his life total than play God Pharaoh's gift and just get a huge advantage out of it. All right, well, camel down. And there's the Avenger follow-up play for Sasabe. Ah, well, Donald's got something of his own here. He's got a Torment of Venom to take down the Merciless Eternal. And Sasabe says, sure, I'll take the three. Uh, that was a good draw. Lethal Sting gives Donald something to do on a turn where he wouldn't have had anything to do. Otherwise, he's one mana short of playing God Pharaoh's Gift. And Chris Tord still does a decent job as a 2-2. Two -two. He's only got the one creature in his graveyard at the moment, an Oketra's Avenger, but you got to feel like he'll not have a hard time finding a few more in there. It's actually kind of funny that... Uh, <laughs> Donald ha maybe has incentive to use Lethal Sting to kill his own Blighted Bat yeah. so he can get it back as a 4 4 flyer. I thought about that too. I figure he can just get more value this way. Oh, wow. Forsake the Worldly in uh, Yusuke's hand. So really? That, that's going to make the whole God Pharaoh's Gift plan much, much dicier. Which is really interesting because, you know, the players, when they have a God Pharaoh's Gift, will really aggressively trade off their creatures. And that could backfire huge for Donald. Well, I guess Yusuke also had the cast out as well, so. <laughs> he has two answers to God for his gift in hand? Oh, boy. Now somehow Yusuke wants Donald Smith to find that land. And Stan, I believe he found a carrion screecher off the top of his library. Smith in the tank now. And now that he missed on the seventh land, he's kind of forced into into taking a slightly more aggressive bent here. He's going to get in for a couple of points of damage and then just play the carrying Screecher. And yeah, you know, the Screecher does actually look like it could do quite a bit of damage this game. <laughs> Kind of funny. Uh, Sasabe says, okay, fine, I'll, I'll use one of my removal spells here, the cast out on your Screecher. And Donald Smith probably breathing a bit of a sigh of relief because he still has his game plan intact with the God Pharaoh's Gift. But uh, unless Sasabe decides to cycle Forsake the Worldly, that will not be the case. Well, I, I'm assuming he brought it in specifically for God Pharaoh's Gift, which he saw right. in game one. That makes the odds of him cycling it a, a lot lower. Right. And note that he did not make a zombie with Cradle of the Accursed, so he definitely has Forsake the Worldly up, and he's going to get yeah. paid off And he here. says, on the end of your main phase... <laughs> wow, so big play there for Yusuke Sasabe. That is uh, an entire game plan being exiled away there by Forsake the Worldly. And that leaves... Sabe up a uh, lethal sting in hand and a slightly better board position and a little bit more life plus a cradle of the accursed. So I, I, I would say that things are looking pretty well for him. He also gets the first draw step, even though he did end up missing there. Though he can combo it off. He can make a zombie with cradle of the accursed and then put a counter on it to, to use that lethal sting right away. Well, he's going to get in for four. Yeah, it looks like he wanted to see what Donald did. Donald didn't do anything, though. Pass the turn back. He finds a carrying Screecher of his own. And that Binding Mummy's still doing a lot of work. It really is. Yeah, the Screecher, of course, is a zombie. So Accursed Horde's going to get tapped down. And in comes the team once again. Donald Smith facing lethal at this point. Does he have the trick to survive? <laughs> He's making it indestructible. All right, he has horn. nothing. <laughs> and that was just a little bit of fun there for Donald Smith at the end of the game. But uh, no fun losing. Yusuke Sasabe picks up game number two and picks up the match as a result. And uh, the hometown player here is going to improve to eight and one. Wow.
Yeah, so impressive run here from Yusuke. So uh, we'll keep an eye on him as he goes through. And uh, Donald, sort of the champion here at this point of uh, Team Lingering Souls at 7-1. and one. It's going to have to fall down to 7-2, and two, but still really good record. And uh, he just needs to get back on track here in Booster Draft before we transition over to Standard in just a little while here. Good stuff to kick things off for the day. Welcome back to the booth. That's Luis Scott Vargas and Marshall Sutcliffe. And uh, we've got two more rounds of Booster Draft to bring you today uh, before we transition back over to Standard and kind of start marching our way up to the top eight. But uh, we've only got one undefeated player left in the field. And it's one of the best players in the field. It's Paulo Vitor Damodarosa, who is now sitting at 9-0. and oh after round nine. Fantastic stuff from Paulo. Yeah, it's gonna, he's looking to rack up his 12th Pro Tour top eight. Yeah. That's a lot more than you have, right? Yeah. Just yeah, as a yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> All I, right. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a lot more updates and such uh, at the news desk, but first, these messages.
Hello, welcome back to the news desk. Maria Bartholdi here to give you some results in the race for draft master. Martin Yuza currently leads the field on 54 points. He is one round up over the rest of the field with two rounds to play. Makis Matsukis takes a loss, drops to 51 points, falling to Corey Burkhart. Uh, Travis Wu loses as that 49 points may well be out of the race at this point. Owen Turtenwalp also lost his round, fell to Matteo Mori of Italy, now on 48 points. Timothy Wu, however, did win 51 points. Christian Calcano, I just got this in, has won as well. Paulo Vito Damadorosa, we saw that on camera, wins as well at 51 points. Still well in contention. Donald Smith taking a loss there at 48 points. But speaking of Timothy Wu, our very own Brian David Marshall is down on the floor with him right now. Thanks, Maria. I'm here with uh, Tim Wu. And Tim, uh, Paul Chion referred to you as somebody that the... Uh, East-West Bowl conglomerate uh, looks to as a, as a limited guy. Is that how you see yourself in your role on the Pro Tour? Um, kind of a little bit. Uh, you know, on the team, I, I definitely like contribute a lot to like the limited portion. Um, I pretty much see myself as more of like the logistics guy, though. Like you know, booking the the conference rooms and the <laughs> hotels and getting people together. But yeah, I mean, limited is is kind of where where my my specialty is. Now, what, what's your personal philosophy when you approach a, a limited format going into a pro tour? Do you have uh, a style that you really advocate? Um, I've I've been known as more of an, an aggressive player. Um, you know, drafting a lot of you know two and three drop creatures, a lot of combat tricks. You know, get whatever removal you can, try and like aggro the my, my opponent out. But um, I found that in Hour of Devastation draft, it's completely different. Um, I've, I've had the most success with these grindy kind of dirtily decks, which is kind of surprises me a little bit, given like my play style. <laughs> yeah, I like to Hour of Promise into Nickel Bolas a yeah. lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have yet to cast Nickel Bolas, but you know, I've cast a couple of gods and, and they've, they've, you know, done some work. I strongly advocate casting Nickel Bolas. Now, it's pretty unusual for a player at 4-4 four and four at the start of the day to get a feature match, but Draftmaster is within reach for you. Um, what needs to happen from here for you to win that sl slot at Worlds? Well, I, I need to 2-0, and I need some people to 0-2. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit out of my hands. I'm going to just try and, you know, win my matches. <laughs> Um, I was kind of in this situation last year. Uh, I 3 0'd my last draft, uh, but you know, uh, Marcio took it down. I finished second last year. I might be bridesmaid again this year, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, finishing second two years in a row for Draftmaster says a lot about why maybe the team would go to you for some uh, limited advice. Now, if you win those two matches, you might as well just keep winning all the way down the stretch. You have some other stuff on the line this year. Yeah, if I if I seven zero the rest of the tournament, I exactly hit platinum. So that would be nice. But you know, my, my basically, my, I mean, I'm I'm pretty. You know, I, I don't play a lot, so my goal every year is just a silver. It's pretty, you know, low. You know, my my goal at every event is just a day two. You know, so I can like get draft cards or something, <laughs> get more cards for my collection, just draft more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a great year. Yeah, and, sitting at gold this year, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's Tim Wu. He's hoping for Draftmaster. He's got to go 2-0. You know, yeah, some couple people need to go too. They're just Hall of Famers. It's no, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Sending it back to you at the desk, Maria. Thanks so much, Brian. I love that. Just trying to get more draft cards for my collection. Well, we talked a lot about blue-red spells. We saw Paulo Vito Damadorosa drafted this morning. But what if you want to draft this deck at home? We've got Rich Hagen and Paul Chian standing by to tell us how.